The man known as a body mechanic, Clint Hill, good time, long-term friend of body science, joins us. He's made a career out of training trainers. He's a programming Olympic lifting specialist. He's got some good info. Let's listen. Welcome to the Body Science Podcast, bringing you everything you need, want, and should know about health, fitness, nutrition, and training. As always, the information contained in this podcast is for the information purposes only and is not designed to diagnose or be prescriptive to treat, prevent, or manage any injury, disease, or other health-related condition. Burn the fat and feed the muscles with this high-protein, low-carb, low-fat, best-tasting daily protein powder. Hydroxy Burn Lean 5 proteins are released in a sustained chronological order, therefore maintaining their different absorption rates, fast and slow, ensuring constant muscle fuel so you stay fit, happy and healthy. This synergistic blend also includes 17 vitamins and minerals, added carnitine, and a proprietary blend of digestive enzymes, Digizyme and Arafti Prebiotic to aid digestive health. Hey, welcome back to Body Science HQ. It is podcast week and we are sitting here with the body mechanic himself, Clint Hill. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Yourself? I'm uh, living the dream, brother. You know that. Good, man. For those of you that don't know and uh, probably haven't been taught by Clint, a lot of you have, two master's degrees in human biomechanics, a second in strength and conditioning from Sydney University and Edith Cowan. Is that how you say it? that's correct. Nice. You hold a level three Australian strength and conditioning association certification? You bet. Is that the right word? Yep. And here's a big one. Master Strength Coach from the National Strength Association in the US. Yep. Wow. I hadn't actually heard of that one before. I haven't had a lot of people <laughs> throw that at a resume before either. I mean, mate, here's a big thing. People come to you to get trained. You spend a lot of your time educating the PT. Yep. So why would I go and, why would I go and see you, the body mechanic? Like, Look, how do the two of those... Sorry, sorry to cut you off. No, there. sure. And like, we don't... We, I want to really talk about what you do and where you're at. Like, yeah. Why, why do I go to see the body mechanic? Look, I guess the it kind of came about as a, as a bit of an interesting progression from, from lecturing and, and running courses. Yep. Um, I just had a lot of people start to delve into the mentorship side of it and want to know more about biomechanics and the understanding of, of different things and how they could fold that over into and, their own and, training. And you know what? That's a good point. For those of us who don't know, what is biomechanics? Biomechanics literally is the the relationship between bone, muscle, ligament, tendon, everything moving together. Rather than looking at one thing independently or, I guess, one area alone, we're trying to make a better movement pattern. So from a bench press right through to running mechanics. So you spend a lot of your time mentoring the trainers in relation to that process. Yeah, exactly. And and trying to then explain to them if one area is dysfunctional, what that's going to carry over to. So if there's something wrong with foot mechanics, how does that mean that their running mechanics are going to be then incorrect? And so h- how do you actually work with the PT on, on that level? Like- Look, I guess it, it all starts with questions. Yep. Um, and I'm a massive person. Every single person I sit down with a mentor, I, I always say, why, why, why? Yep. Like it's the big question that I hit every single one of them with. And really what that comes down to for me is that I want to know what has occurred for yep. them to get to that point. So the whole history, the movement history, what they've actually done with their training history, all of it. It has to be a, a complete package because I think that's where, where the industry is going wrong. Yep, and going wrong. In, in what way? Well, there's there's obviously a lot of trainers that think they're super specific and this is their field and they own this particular space or whatever it happens to be. But I think the the really key thing for me is making sure and understanding the relationship between it all whether it's working with physios and chiros to get the right the right approach or or making sure you actually understand what recovery therefore does for an athlete for their long-term training program so mate you talk about the history are are we dealing with older populations here and we talk about biomechanics and athletes or are you you're dealing with a lot of younger athletes these days. How, what's, what's happening? Yeah, look, uh, honestly, um, I, I think I've, I've sort of pushed to both, both ends of the spectrum. Um, in, the, in the early part of my career, I was probably spending more time around the team-based stuff. So looking through, uh, you know, working with clubs and so on and so forth and, and really aiming in the middle of the bell curve. So sort of hitting that big 70%, that, that really bang for your buck chunk. And then as I've sort of moved through my career, I've been probably more fortunate enough to work with more of the individuals and actually see, therefore, that, that you can really pinpoint one of those things. Now, what we're seeing now with, you know, especially in Sydney with the private schools, 
is we're getting 16, 17 year old kids coming through that are wanting to be the next big thing in whatever sport. And their mums and dads are shoveling them into to, you know, high level S and C early at that age to try and make sure that there is no dysfunction because they're finding out stories of players, you know, whether it be a wallaby that's, you know, held a held a, a condition or a dysfunction their whole way through their career that could have been fixed early in life. Uh, you, you mentioned their high level S and C. What does that mean for for those who don't know? Yeah, look, I guess that's a that's a, a really good one, Jay. Why? Because mm-hmm. the 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 big part about the the S and C industry right now is is. You know, and, and we talk about this a lot um, in relation to guys like Dan Baker and David Boyle and so on and so forth. What's occurred um, in the in the past few years is those guys have really <coughs> nailed down, and this is through the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association, of course, um, that as of January 1, uh, no, no professional sports team will be allowed to employ someone who doesn't have a degree or a level two at minimum and be part of the professional coaching or structure. And. Or or and. Okay. Um, so basically what that means is that the the true S and C, the the qualified, the 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 person that's done their time in the trenches and made sure that they've actually got their qualifications will be will rise to the top. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's taken a long time for that to occur because they had to get the Australian Coaching Council on side, they had to get the AIS on side, they had to get everyone on side because it really does, uh, I guess, set the industry standard for making sure that you are well qualified is probably the right way to word it. Okay. So you spent a bit of time at the AIS, you did a bit of talent ID, you played the game. You want to tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, I was lucky enough that uh, the through the process of the the AIS Talent ID program. Um, and you're an athlete at the time. And I was that's an with, athlete. That's where you identified, yep. yeah. So I was I was playing rugby for New South Wales and, and water polo for New South Wales as at schoolboy level. Um, and first went to the AIS and and you know went through the first sports science sort of uh, setup that I that I had the opportunity to see and and really sparked my interest from there and then I was lucky enough to to get a scholarship to Sydney Uni mm-hmm. um, and I went on to to exercise sports science there and then into my masters. Nice. What made you do a masters? So at the time, I mean, it's a, it's a fair step beyond uh, a PT certification. Like yeah, you, you've done the hard yards and you. Probably, I guess the, the the big part of that was at the time um, I was still playing footy, mm-hmm. and not that I was ever going to be you know a, a wallaby or, or or a great footy player. I, I was just a, a solid toiler, and and I just loved the work part of it. I loved mm-hmm. the training side of it. Um, <laughs> but what I saw was an opportunity to a get a good education, but also b further my knowledge. Um, and I got a real thirst for that at when I was at Sydney Uni. So I um, had the opportunity to, to go through and continue that on scholarship. So it was a, it was a no-brainer from my end to, uh, to further my, my education. And I mean, I've still pushed that heavily with everyone that I mentor and train today, that education's key. Man, I've noticed that you're one of the few S&C coaches that's playing in the bodybuilding arena now. Like it, it, you, Dr. Chris Mack plays yep. there as well. And I mean, you, you don't hear a lot. There's a lot of coaches and a lot of... Uh, people who are very good at what they do in their niche. But I, I know that one of our IFBB athletes went to see you and she looked incredible on stage when she went to the US. But yep. why, why would a bodybuilder come and see you when you're talking about you know, training systems to make people more efficient, propulsion, analyzing, you know, what you talk about before, um, the way the foot lands on the yeah, ground sure. versus the knee? And, and well, the, look, uh, Elise is an interesting one, actually, because, and, and with, with every single person that I deal with, one of the key attributes for me is is treating everyone the exact same way. Yeah. Now, I don't mean treating them the exact same way as though, you know, you do the same thing with every single person. I mean, you look at everyone's t- right down to minuscule details. Now, Elise had a really unique issue, which is a bodybuilding thing, where she couldn't get her lats to flare properly. Mm-hmm. And she couldn't get her bum to grow the way that, that the IFBB guys wanted Bring on the peach, it. you say? Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, there were no banded uh, crappy little exercises where she <laughs> did frog pumps and carried on for 45 minutes. But the, the key there was realistically to treat it as a, a, a biomechanics issue Yep. and work out why she wasn't getting the result that she wanted to in that area. Because, look, it's, pretty, it's a no-brainer. She, she's one of the hardest-working athletes that I've ever 
ever worked with. She's a pretty empowered, inspiring female, if you ask me. Absolutely. Any yeah. anyone single mum, three kids. Yeah. Crazy story. Yeah. Manages a cold. Absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah. Starts work. And at still 4 gets up there and does it. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, but um, but we just went through and we we pulled apart the body and and went through every individual issue, um, and and designed a program around that. Yeah, it's interesting because we at Firelex this year we had the ninety eight gym team there mm-hmm. doing their their sessions and. That there was a bit of gym gear there from one of the crews, and um, Elise was doing some deadlifts. Yep. And I remember Kev walked over and said, "What are you doing?" Yeah. And she actually came out to me. She goes, "I've been bodybuilding for X number of years. Yeah. I didn't actually know that I wasn't doing that properly." Yeah. Look, and I think that's probably one of the things that that bodybuilding has has kind of done wrong for 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 a significant period of time. If they got the result of gaining muscle mass. They just thought that was good enough yep. rather than going to that next level and consulting, you know, a, an SNC or, or even just a, a really good qualified coach. Yep. Um, because I've seen, you know, some some uh, bodybuilding coaches just whack out the same program to every single person and then just tell you to jack the weight up. And that was their method of, of I guess, uh, progressive overload. Yep. Um, whereas, obviously, we look at every option you've got, whether it be changing exercise, changing tempo, changing the, the number of exercises you do in a set or, or whatever the, the case may be. I don't think, Elise, mind you are, you, are you happy to talk to us about what you did change in her program? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Because yeah. I think a lot of people out there who listen to this lift stuff and they'd yep. love to know, you know, you don't get to talk to someone who's done biomechanics that often. Yep. So I guess, uh, firstly, we did, uh, we did a full, sc- full screening, mm-hmm. which means we go through and we do a series of tests which check mobility, flexibility, movement patterns, how individual muscles move in relation to another. So, for example, um, it, a lot of people would know what uh, it's called a functional movement screen where you do things like a walking lunge, which will then show you which muscles switch on or, or activate at the right times. Uh, and from there, you've got the opportunity to go through and go, okay, well, that's not firing on the correct pattern or one particular area is not working as well as another. Yep. Um, and, and we found some really unique flaws in her physique. Mm-hmm. So things like... Geez, low, you must have been looking close. <laughs> look, well, the thing is when someone is that lean, you've actually got... It's an easier way to tell um, because you can actually see the muscle activating or not. Yeah. You can see that there's too much muscle bulk on the right, not enough on the left, those kind of things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and even she'll tell you now that if she looks back at some of the photos of her on stage in the past, she can now see where there was more muscle bulk in one particular area or she was able to get lat flare in one particular area or, you know, some, some hip rotation or internal external rotation to get a different different shape of, of her quad, those kind of things. But we went through and ta- taught her how to train differently rather than just sticking to the standard exercises which were getting her the standard results that she'd gotten. Yeah. So, mate, tell me, like, she, she's a she's a – when you're – Look at pictures of her. She is unbelievable. Her condition, conditioning is next level for yep. um, for a mum. Yeah, absolutely. Mate, when you, you talked about switching on muscles versus what she'd been doing in the past, yep. Why would a bodybuilder give a shit about that? Okay, I guess what what that means is your your central nervous system fires in different in different ways. Yep. Okay, so if I if if I pull with my right arm, my right arm is firing a different way to my left. Yep. So one of the things that occurred there is we had to balance out between both sides of the body. So she had she had a, a very unique, I guess, flaw that was that there was more muscle bulk on one side of her body than the other. One side was tighter than the other, so therefore we had to actually train her unilaterally to make sure that we got we still got the bulk, but then bilaterally to make sure that we could get the range on one side and loosen the other. And is that a big job in a bodybuilder? Look, it's... it's I mean, a, she hadn't just started. She'd been bodybuilding for a while. Yeah, that's right. It's it, Where it becomes different is that you then have the, the, the change that is, that's not what normal bodybuilders do. Mm. So she'd be talking to her girlfriends or, or guys that, that she knew that were bodybuilders in the industry and they weren't doing the exercises that she was doing or the rep range or the tempo that she was, she was doing because... The, her program was written uniquely for her and what she needed to achieve, which the judges had told her she needed to achieve. Okay, so she went back to scratch, said, I need to make change, and let's make change. Yeah, you bet. So, mate, just talking about the industry, I mean, 
Elisa's got a coach yep. and all that. Like, how hard was it for her to introduce someone with biomechanics to, you know, an established coach? Like, she, she's surrounded by some good people. You bet. Um, was that you guys having a coffee and discussing where you're going? Is that, you know, was there a bit of, I don't need you, you don't need me type stuff? Like, mm. I, I hear a lot of, a lot of positives. There's a lot of coaches that are looking. Yep. To, I mean, you need a team around, everyone needs a team around yep. them. So how did that process fall out? Look, I, I you guess only work with one bodybuilder, don't you? Uh, no, I work with a couple, but okay. but she'd be the, the the one that you guys would know the most. Yep. Um, and and I guess there's there's a couple of other guys who have consulted with me over the years, and 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 I still mentor a few PTs that are bodybuilders. Yeah, because I, well. I, I asked you that question because that because you train a lot of PTs and a lot of PTs yes. get involved in um, yeah that that side of the world. Yeah. So. Mate, how, how did that conversation go? Look, I guess the, the big thing, and I don't think it matters whether it's with a coach, with a nutritionist, it doesn't matter who it's with. Mm -hmm. It's got to be an open and honest conversation. Mm -hmm. And that really comes down to both parties saying what they need to get out, yep. um, but also not stepping on others' toes. Like, you know, we talk about, you know, and, and we spoke about it off air about staying in your own lane, you know, yep. and, and it's become a ridiculous catch cry of our industry at the moment. But... I don't believe in staying in your own lane. I yep. believe in knowing what your lane is and then consulting other specialists to make sure that you're, you're part of that same nice. process, yep. right? So in that regard, I, I don't do the nutrition stuff like a, a perfectly qualified nutritionist is mm -hmm. going to do or like her coach does or those kind of things. The, the manipulations around macros and micronutrients, I couldn't give two shits about. Yep. Okay, it's got nothing to do with me. I don't care. Yep. Um, but what I do care about is that she's got enough energy to do the sessions that I require from her. So when when it comes down to that stuff, we were also working with a physio, um, an ART specialist to get the results that we wanted to get. Yep. So it's building the right team to get the right result. I like that. So, mate, just thinking forward on like I'm harping on the biomechanics yeah, side, but it's really good to get a someone with that background so you're looking at physique. Are you looking at other areas of the body outside of the muscle when you're talking? Yeah, of course, of course. Because so she's a tall, she's a tall woman. Okay, right. Yeah. So she, the category that she that she works in, or, or sorry, in IFBB that she competes in, is the tall category, right? Yep. So you also have to then look at limb and lever length. Now, you you mentioned before, you know, Kev saying about her deadlift being incorrect, yeah. right? So. That was because she was probably deadlifting just like everyone else was in her gym. Yeah. Because she, you know, the the gym that she trains out at at Campbelltown where she where she lives, great gym, fantastic. Good facility. gym, we love that gym. Good gym, fantastic. <laughs> okay, yeah. But the the big thing there is it's it's a real heavy bodybuilding gym. Yeah. Now your typical bodybuilders and everyone knows that they're they're short, stocky, solid people, yep. right? Elise is tall. Mm. She's almost six foot tall. She's she's a tall woman. Okay, yep. so you've got to look at limb and lever length to understand the relationship of what that actually requires. Yep. So we had to change things like a de deadlift pattern, do more things like Romanian deadlift, some of them single leg, and and make sure that you actually understand why she was doing that. Um, little minor corrections that had to occur during that to get the, the muscle to, to work in the way we were looking to get it to work. Mate, so I know I'm harping on this bodybuilding and biomechanics part yep. at the moment, but I think it's a really cool part for us, and I've said that as well. <laughs> what should a bodybuilder be considering when they pick, like you are Clint underscore Hill Strengths on Insty, yep. so if somebody wants to look you yep. up, okay, and you've got a website, you're ready for this, kids, I'm about to say the whole alphabet here. Hill Strength and A N D performance.com.au I think that's like 28 letters <laughs> so I wouldn't do anything if it wasn't complicated exactly so look the reason I threw that in there is you do you do a lot of educating of PTs and yes. you run a lot of courses and yep. what type of courses are you running so periodization programming um Wade Farmer and I are just about to launch a, a power education seminar, which will be in relation to chocolate box training. Um, we will we'll go through and do a, a series of testing and then roll that into the program. So we'll, we'll explain a lot more of the stuff that we've talked about today in depth. Yeah. So if I'm a... If I'm if I've got some bodybuilding clients, am I going to go to that session or not? Yeah. Look, I mean that particular I'm one. Trying to probably, get out of you. What am I going to get out of that? Yeah. Probably. Not, uh, Look, that one in particular is probably more sport-based. Yep, power. Yep. Yep. 
the 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 programming and periodization is definitely based around how to actually get the most out of your training one of the key things and and this is one of the reasons that i've been involved with body science for so long is the the muscle recovery side of things is a huge part of what of, of i guess getting the most out of your training session absolutely yeah and one of the things that I see is a huge issue and, and you know, I've got athletes like Cam Girdlestone and Kendrick Louie and guys like these. That How is Kendrick? Kendrick's really well, mate. Yeah, really he looks well. good on Insta. You he look, look great, mate. <laughs> he always looks good. God love him. <laughs> Best hair in the business. He does. Um, but making sure, and I guess the, the, the key to that is understanding what they want to get out of it and how to get the most out of their session. So for me, that's, that's about what does their recovery look like? what does their their training look like and does their training actually supersede their their recovery or are we are we making sure that the athlete is getting what they need um so when it comes to a bodybuilder i treat them in the same way because i think the problem with bodybuilding over the years has been that people have just continued to train on top of train and just continue to overload and overload and overload and people don't then end up making stage or they make stage and look shit yeah um, so I've treated them in the exact same way as you would treat an Olympic athlete and move down the path of going, no, today's going to be a rest day because you're not recovered well enough. And hey, mate, let's, let's jump on that Olympics. You brought it up there. Like yep. you obviously, uh, Olympic silver medal with, um, Cam Girdlestone. Yep. What type of things did you do for Cam that changed his world? Oh, wow. That's an interesting one. So Cam, uh, Cam's, uh, he's also a school teacher. Mm-hmm. So um, he's at Shaw School in Sydney. Um, he just got married on the weekend, which congratulations, well done, Cam Congrats. and Zanny. Um, but uh, the, the big thing, you know, with someone like Cam was that when he first came to me, he'd not really included much of the Olympic lifting. And he also was well and truly underweight for the category that he wanted to, to, to row at. Now, so it, how, how do you know that? Well, so he was a lightweight scholar and yeah. wanted to get up to Okay, to, so he to had the a heavy. strategy where yeah, he wanted to go. Was, yeah, yeah, gotcha, yeah, okay. But f- what that then meant was going through analysing and talking to the right people, not me making some shit calorie number up in my head and going, you must eat X number of calories. It was about formulating a plan with other specialists to get yeah. them to the right amount of training and also the right amount of eating to get that. And as you know, rowers, and, and I think most people would understand that rowing is an incredibly demanding sport where they're on the water from 5 a.m. till 7 a.m. most mornings. They could row up to 20 k's in that, in that time each day. So there's some huge, huge distance and huge calorie deficit concern. So we had to do some really interesting stuff just around Cam's nutrition to start with, whereby we had to put a George Foreman grill in his dormitory because he, he, he worked at the school as a teacher, but he also was a dorm master. So to make sure that he could hit his protein intake, we put a little George Foreman grill in his, in his room and yeah. uh, away you went, you know. So there was just strategies that we had to use. And, and, you know, Cam is the biggest, biggest advocate for Nitrovol that you would ever believe. <laughs> um, we love you too, mate. Because he literally, you know, we got to a point where we were putting Nitrovol on ice cream yeah. to get the calories in to, so that he could balance out his day of, of rowing. Now... When it came to the training side of it, again, it's no different to what I was just talking about with Elise. I pulled it apart right down to the nth degree of biomechanics. What are the principles? What are we missing? What's happened in the past? What's the history? How do we actually get to that right point? So realistically, again, you know, without without sort of sounding like a broken record, it's the exact same thing. You treat people the way you want to be treated and break it down to those individual movement patterns. Okay. Well, since I've got you here, I'm going to hit you up some freebies for everyone. Let's do it. Let's talk about, you do a lot of programming in Olympic lifting. You're, yep. you're classified as a bit of a specialist in that area. Yep. So what are you doing for people in that area and what should people be looking for? Look, I, I think the, the really key thing around Olympic lifting um, is making sure that your mobility is right to achieve what you want to achieve out of it. And for those of us who don't understand that, what do you mean by mobility? Okay. So one of the biggest things that I'm, I'm seeing at the moment, especially with obviously the, the, the huge popularity of CrossFit, there's people doing things like snatch um, and, and I guess overhead lifts that in the past probably wouldn't have occurred in a normal gym scenario. Yep. So there's a lot of shoulder health issues that are coming through but that, that leads right down to ankle mobility. 
yep. right? Guys like Kelly Scarrett have gone through and written, you know, you know, the supple leopard books about, you know, being mobile from every single joint through the body or as stable and other joints to make sure that you can do those particular lifts. One of the areas that I look at and believe is a huge takeaway for anyone for, from the podcast is making sure that firstly, you know which joints need to be mobile and which joints need to be stable. Have you got any, anything for us to read on that? Yeah, look, I mean, Kelly Scarrett's uh, it, it, Supple Leopard is, is an excellent read. Okay. We'll get Morg to chuck the link yep, down the absolutely. bottom. Bodyscience.com.au forward slash podcast. Yep. Um, but also... Anything the, on your website, mate? We don't, don't want to crack at your website because... Look, there's a, a very simple Mac document. owns Instagram, so I can't <laughs> talk about your Instagram, but man, what's your website like? There's a... I've got a really simple diagram that I'll, I'll give you guys the link to, which yep. just shows you across the body from ankle upwards, which joint needs to be mobile, nice. which joint needs yep. to be stable. It's a very simple document, and it can be the, the literally the starting of your of your warm-up. Because yeah. you, you, I talk to a lot of people in the industry, not yep. many people, I mean, it's probably not super cool to talk about, about mobility, I suppose, but you don't hear a lot of people talk. I mean, you, you, I look at the 98 gym and what, what you guys are doing and what, where you're going, like yep. you guys are all very much into that aspect of yep. it. How, what's your one takeaway that someone should be thinking about when it comes to mobility? Like, what, why would I give a shit? Injury prevention is the first thing that pops into into yep. my mind, okay? If I can keep an athlete, client, whatever it is, healthier by doing that, yep. then of course I'm going to choose that every single time. Now, I, where where that leads me to is realistically understanding that that each person will have an individual area of tightness. Let's say that you tore a hamstring when you were 17, Okay, the chances are if you didn't rehab that properly, that is going to be part of your your body's history forever. Forever. You okay, yeah. so you need to be in a position that that is where an area that you do more work on to be ready for a training session. Okay, so mate, Olympic lifting is going to get more popular. Like it's got a fair oh, bit yeah. of growth at the moment. Like. Yep. It's good to see the girls in the gym lifting stuff, kicking some tin too. Like. Absolutely. Look, I, I think Olympic lifting is still uh, is still got a long, long way to go. The amateur comps in Sydney that are happening right now are, are huge. Mm-hmm. Um, there'll, there'll be, you know, even powerlifting. So the gym that I'm working out of at the moment, Lift Performance Centre in Redfern, is uh, we have a powerlifting squad and a weightlifting squad. Okay. Now, they, they're full all the time because it... It's just such a fun way to train. And the other part of it is the programming's better than you can find in other places. Yeah. You know, people actually, you know, we've got fully qualified powerlifting coaches and weightlifting coaches writing the programs for these things that are unique and individual to the to the athletes. They're, it's not a one size fits all cookie cutter style program. It's 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 based around doing that. Okay. I'm just getting a little message from my production manager over there. She's telling me, can you define what Olympic lifting actually is for people who Absolutely. don't get that? We should probably step back a little bit and talk about what that is. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I guess there's there's two main Olympic lifts, which are the clean and, clean and jerk yep. or, or the clean and, and you snatch. You might want to explain what that is. Look, uh, both of the – so in the Olympics, yep. and, and that's the and reason that's why they're called Olympic, Olympic lifting. Lift. Okay, it's a good place to start. Okay, that's yeah. a pretty good place to start. You yeah. have you have two competitions, and they're, they're run as, as one part of – or two. Two, two events run, run as one part of the competition. The clean and jerk, which is a, a movement where you go from a deadlift, getting the bar all the way up to, to your shoulders and then pressing overhead. Yep. Max weight, so on and so forth. And the snatch is a different grip where your hands are as wide out on the bar as basically you can get them. And again, you're going straight from the ground all the way up. So you don't pause at your, at your, at your chest to get it up. And I might be throwing you out in front of a bus here, but is there any actual reason why they are classified as Olympic lifts? Do you know, it, that's a really good question. And the only answer that I can give you, and, and very simply, is that back in the day when, when, you know, when we go back to ancient Greece and whatever else, the, the, uh, the events were based around what they had access to. Mm-hmm. So clearly... Mm-hmm. That was a, a, a bar with some rocks stuck on the side of it, yeah. and who could do who could do the heaviest one? Yeah, nice. It's good to see people have never changed in life. I can no lift one heavy shit. I can lift heavy shit. And I'm going to be better yeah. than you, <laughs> mate. You are like let, that's enough about bodybuilders, and um, let's talk about the biomechanics and recovery. Why yep. why would somebody want to see someone with your qualification, and why do people really care about recovery? Yeah, okay, good one. Look, I, I think. Over the years, one of the key factors that I've seen is athletes fail because of failure to recover. Mm-hmm. 
Now, some of that can be through injury, some of that can be through, you know, poor management, but and some of it can probably be through alcohol abuse. But you know, there's there's definitely a key there to to talk about how how that manifests itself. Now, every athlete that comes to me, every PT that comes to me, every S and C that comes to me to mentor them, one of the key things that I want to set out is a correct structure for what that should look like. Now. It can be done in any manner of different ways, you know, and and that might be, let's say, uh, for example, that you know, someone like I'll I'll go back to to Kendrick and Cam, mm-hmm. okay. If if there's forty minutes between where they train and getting home, mm-hmm. it's straight into compression garments, protein shake, BCAAs, whatever top ups they need food wise in that period of driving home. Yep. So then they're utilizing times to get the recovery started faster. Okay. We've always known, you know, the the simple th- thought processes around things like taking a protein shake once yep. you finish training to get that that pro- protein in and making sure that you're starting that recovery process. But realistically, we've taken it to over the last 5 years, it's gone to a total another level. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's obviously, you know, footy teams and things like that all have always had massage therapists, mm-hmm. but they've never gone to the point that they're going to now, which is looking into foam rollers, activations, um, having ART specialists, having all of these kind of, I guess, baseline things that have to occur around their health and wellness, how much sleep they're getting, making sure that they're taking their supplements, everything is now being tracked and recorded. Mate, you jumped on foam rollers and I think everyone owns one. Yep. Let's be honest, I see a lot of people jump on the foam roller, go, oh, shit, that hurts, and get off within a minute or two yeah. and go, I just rolled. Sensational. Yep. Do you want to give us some 101s or top five tips on yeah. foam rolling? Look, I, I think that... Including time commitment? Sure. Um, so as, as part of every every athlete and every client's warm-up, they have 15 minutes of warm-up with me, and at least five minutes of that will be foam rolling. So that's now, pre-training? Pre-training. Okay. Okay. Now... The reason that I do it pre-training is because then also I can see that that's actually occurring to start with, yep. but it's also part of the best the best time to activate the muscles. Yep. So if I can make sure that to start with that their individualized protocol is written based around what they need. So let's say uh, a, a, an Olympic rower, mm-hmm. okay? The areas that they're gonna be incredibly tight in are hip flexors, lower back, probably the upper shoulders, depending on what they've trained the day before, may also change that. That could also be the executive diet too because I could pretty much tick all those boxes (laughs) off today. Well, look, I I think that's the other thing. Like there's no point not looking at an executive or or someone who sits in an office exactly the same way Mm. because if if you sit here for eight hours a day doing podcasts – Okay, your hip flexors are going to get tight. Your calves are going to get tight because you haven't stood up for for eight hours. Your back's going to get sore. Your core's going to switch off. So you're saying All I should stand things. up now, mate? Like, Absolutely. Just do a little stand up. Quick little right. stand up and get on with it. But I, I think the really key factor to that is making sure that you understand why each person is doing it. Um, and I think that, that it's gone down the path of everyone knows that recovery is something that should occur, mm-hmm. but they just don't know what things they should be doing for them. Okay, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person training four or five times a week. I don't have anyone with a biomechanics degree yep, sure. giving me a little heads up every morning. What, I've got a foam roller. Yep. Can you give us some one Start at the bottom and work your way up. Yep. Yep. Look. Are we rolling long muscles? Are we holding on sore points? What okay. are we doing? So I definitely start by telling everyone that if there's a sore point, you definitely need to hold on it. Yep. Okay. That's a, that's a, everyone talks about trigger points and so on and so forth. It, it's just an accumulation of some type of waste product, whichever one, it doesn't really matter yep. for the purpose of discussion. Okay. But if you can get rid of that, then you're going to be benefit. You're going to cause a benefit. Yep. Okay. So I tell everyone to start by doing everything even. Okay. So if, if we're not able to write a specific protocol for someone, then separate the body exactly that way two and a half minutes in the lower body two and a half minutes in the upper body make sure that you move through calves quads itbs hamstrings hip flexors glutes lower back into the upper back chest shoulders done so the whole lot in five minutes or two and a half per part two and a half for a lower and two and a half for upper you don't need to go absolutely overboard the thing that you need to remember is that if that if that's five minutes you weren't doing before, that's five minutes you're better off. Yeah. Okay. And when you say better off, what am I better off for? Well, you're better off because you're going to get increased blood flow. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So it's it, it, which again, is important, one hundred percent important. Okay, we're going to be able to move waste products around the body, which yeah. again, like we talk all the time about how often players should be wearing their compression garments yeah. to make sure that that stuff occurs. Okay, the the other key factor is you're also going to know what is tight. Yeah. So when you go into your training session, if you've found a tight spot in your shoulder, you're going to look at your particular training session and go, hang on a sec, should I really be doing overhead presses today because my shoulders are wrecked? Okay. What if everything hurts? Well, unfortunately, there you're Just in it. going to put my hand up right now. <laughs> Probably should jump off the foam roller and get in the pool. Yeah, okay. Nice. So, mate, um, I might hit you up if you could put a little foam rolling yeah, sure. uh, program at the bottom or yep. if you could throw it on your website and we'll, we'll put a link at the bottom. Yeah, look, I, th- I think the easy one there for, would be definitely to add in that, but also the other modalities of recovery. Mm-hmm. So making sure that people understood why someone might use an ice bath, why a, a, a rugby player might wear compression garments, why someone might you know, take... Uh, do the Wim Hof breathing method, any of those type of things. The it's Wim Hof a, breathing method. There it is. Well, I have the oxygen sucking bricks <laughs> method at the end of training sessions. But, mate, I'll, I will jump on that in a second, what that means, because yep. nobody apart from your gurus will actually know what that means. Sure. But let's talk about, you mentioned hot and cold baths. Okay. Where are we at? Like the, the science is changing on that affair. Yeah. Isn't it? Okay. So I guess the, the really key, the key thing to note here to start with is that I could find you a research paper that says it's as good as it as, is as bad. Yep. Okay. Now, the stuff that's coming out at the moment says if you like it, you're going to get benefit. Yep, if you great. hate it, you are not going to get benefit because what occurs is the body goes into that fight or flight mode, that yep. parasympathetic nervous system jumps on and says, no, Let's I do go. not want to do this. Okay. So therefore there's definitely a, a huge part to that at the moment. Um, and they're doing some really good stuff down at the AOS at the moment around how to alter someone's state or what temperature someone who hates the idea of getting into an ice bath can tolerate. Well, all athletes pretty much hate it, but most love when you're like, like I talked to a lot of yep. athletes about ice baths and everyone goes, oh, I hate my ice bath, but they cannot wait to get in it if there's one to get yes. into. So, so when they've felt the benefit, yep. then they, they're more than happy to get in it. Okay. Now, I guess the other thing up here, you're in a different, you know, so we're sitting in the Gold Coast. Okay. It's 27 degrees today. It's, it's. Yeah. We're not 14. walking into St. Kilda and our legs in the water. Correct. Yeah. It's 14 degrees in Sydney today and raining sideways. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. It really does come down to a huge difference in not just the sport, but also your, the, the external environment. Okay. So, I mean, if I'm having a crack at F45 or yep. CrossFit and I've had a big session and I'm feeling quite sore, do I, can, what have I got to do to make my own ice bath? Oh, look, super easy. Get a bag of ice and throw it in your ice, throw it in your... In your and that's cold enough? That's cold enough. And how much of the body's going in? As much as you can get in. Yep. Yep, as much as you can get in. The key factor is if you've worked more legs... Mm-hmm. Keep your legs in for longer. Yep. If you've worked more upper body, keep your lo- your upper body in for longer. And is there a timing post training that we should be trying to consider here, or okay, just get it done? So interestingly enough, and this is where some of the really cool research is coming out. Um, the AFL guys are now doing the following morning. Okay. Okay. Now the reason that they're doing that is what they were finding is that the the physiological markers uh, of finishing a game already being tired, being exhausted, then having to jump into an ice bath, they're already physically and mentally exhausted, then you're throwing them into an ice bath, which is a, a, a situation where they go into that. And that's what you're talking about. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Got, yeah. So that's that fight or flight mechanism where the body goes, shit, I don't want to do this. Please just stop doing this. You're going to hurt me. Okay. And when are they feeling better? At what hours is that? Is that working 48, 72? Where are we at? They're, they're, they're at about 24 to 48 at the okay. moment. Yep. And that's where they're playing with. Yep. And it's really interesting because the, the way this came out is, is a lot of the AFL teams were taking their players to the beach the mm-hmm. following morning. Yep. Okay. So they've played at three o'clock the following, the previous day. The following day, whether they've gone out and had a couple of beers, had dinner, whatever the case may be, let them sleep in 11, 12 o'clock, then they're going to the beach. They saw that the guys were mucking around a hell of a lot more. There was a lot more fun involved in yeah, it, gotcha. and they didn't they didn't care so much how long they had to be in the water. Yeah. So all of a sudden that started, and we were talking about this downstairs earlier, about it starts with theory, it then goes to science, yeah. it then goes to research, and then from there we, do, we develop a process. Yeah. And this is a huge part of that because – these guys saw that occurring. Now, these are sports scientists. These are high-level SNCs, high-level performance coaches going, hang on a sec. 
what's just happened here? Okay, I'm now seeing my players happier to stay in there for longer. Yeah. I used to force them to stay in there for 10 minutes. Now they're mucking around out there with a footy for 20 minutes. Yeah. I'm getting better benefit out of this. Therefore, that's then following over to I can then train them faster. I can train them a day earlier than I could have trained them. Okay. So it's simple stuff like that that really starts that process when it comes to that. Now, when you drag that back to your average Joe that goes to the gym four or five days a week, you can still use the same principles. Okay, is an ice bath going to benefit you? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you fucking hate it, it's not. Yeah, it's that simple. Yeah. Okay, but you know, I, I I muck around with my my rugby players all the time and sit in the ice bath and you know, pop the arms up and uh, and sit there for as long as I possibly can because I love it. But I also do it just to annoy the shit out. Yeah, you would. Yeah. Yeah. One in, all in. One in, all in, 100%. So, mate, if I um, if I don't have access to ice, is a cold shower doing me any benefit? Yeah. Look, hot, cold showers still still does the same thing. So the vasoconstriction and the vasodilation of the, of, the, of the muscles pumps blood through the body. And that's what we're trying to do with an ice bath? Correct. And it's the same concept that, that you guys have always known with compression. Okay. You have the panelling in slightly different directions to cause different effects on each of the muscles. This is the same concept flowing on into that area so what we're doing is by putting the cold we, we get a vasoconstriction yep. and then we pump it back to hot and we get a vasodilation and everything pumps through the body and okay. so what's our off on what are we doing that for how long look there's again the research is is you know i can find you one thing that says do 30 seconds on 30 seconds off I can what's find work you for another you? minute 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 okay. minute you like to keep it yep. simple i keep it really simple and the thing that i do especially with my rugby players is i actually set up the showers in that regard so yeah, i've heard that about so you I've got, hanging yeah, around the showers i do like do like the showers <laughs> but making sure you've got like six showers set up for example one hot one cold one hot one oh, so cold, they're walking one from so one to the walk, next one they walk through and that way you probably don't get a burn situation because exactly of control because right. that yep. would be a problem yep. wouldn't it? Yeah. and and you don't get you don't have people having to manipulate it change things around and also you've got six blokes in there suffering at the same time yeah nice nice so mate you've got some other um, concepts you've been playing with like you talked about was it the Wim Hof breathing method yeah. or something yep. excuse me because I have no idea what he's talking about <laughs> there. and uh, infrared saunas are making a comeback with you yeah so um, I've got an infrared sauna in my garage yep um, and I, I started experimenting um, with the, the Wim Hof stuff um, through what is Wim Hof Wim Hof it's is a human is a, obviously is a human yeah yep um, he's basically he he's I guess changing the thought processes around what breathing should be and, and how it should work. And this is during post everything, everything just considering breathing. So the guy's a bit of a freak. He's mm -hmm. done the uh, Everest marathon with no shoes on and wow. you know, a pair of shorts. Yep. Um, so he's, he's got some clearly more mental, more mental problems than a mental hospital. Like we were talking about with, with Kiko. Scary. <laughs> Mate, look, it's, it's, it's interesting. Let's just call it that at the moment. But the, the Wim Hof stuff um, is directly related to the ice baths. It's also directly related to, to hot therapy. Yep. Um, the idea is that if you're, if you're utilizing your system to the best of its ability, you get a better result. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, and you were talking about uh, uh, Dr. Duncan earlier today, um, we were talking about doing you know, a hot shower in the yep. final minute doing cold. Yep. Okay. So Wim does cold only. Okay. Because he believes that the stimulation of that cold water, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what's going on in the world, is is better for your body. Okay, boosts immunity, all of these things that he claims. Yep. Okay. Now, again, when I say he claims, there are some research papers that are that are happy to back up a lot of that study. Mm -hmm. Now, guys like uh, that that you would know of, you know, you know, Whippet and and you know, Deno Gladstone and guys like that yep. are right into this at the moment. They're really feeding off that around okay. around their training and they're getting the benefits from that well, stuff Whippet as well. Whippet does some mad stuff. Yeah, and sorry, these the are the guys from Bondi, Bondi Rescue, Rescue, so yeah. so you know, just just to to tie this all together. You know, there's some there's some big names being involved in this, and I I first got involved through um, Led Hamilton, who's a big wave surfer yep. from Hawaii. Um, he runs a he runs an organisation called XPT, um, and that's how I first got really introduced to how this all worked. Um, you know, he's doing deep dive therapy in in a pool at his house at Malibu, which is 25 metres deep, where you take a set of dumbbells to the bottom of the pool and then push off the bottom of the the, the pool to try and 
replicate being held under big waves and those kind of things. Amazing. So all of this stuff ties through the Wim Hof breathing method. It ties through just better breathing mechanics. Yep. Um, and also into making sure that you're looking for what's next in the in the I guess the uh, the series of what's going to occur around training, research, and and the next phenomena. So I've got ten or so people train at my gym every night. Yep. None of us are. Well, there's a few young ones in there. I apologise to you guys for saying this. <laughs> I like to think everyone's my age. We're all the one age. Mate, so give me a basic overview. Training four times a week, five times a week. Yep. Give me some ideas of what I should look at to look at hot, cold, ice baths. I mean, obviously, that's a tough one for yeah. most people who live busy lives. Infrared saunas, what should I do? Give me a basic plan. All right. So first things first, I think that if you if you can make sure that you do something major once a week, you, you're going to be ahead of the game. So let's start at once a week. Yep. So let's go yep. straight to, well, even if it's just get in the ocean. Yep. Okay. Starting point is definitely do more. Mm -hmm. Okay. The more recovery you do, the faster you can recover and the more we can train. Yep. Okay. That's the starting point. Okay. And from there, everything's a benefit. But what I would certainly say to you is that would be where I would be looking to do things like, you know, get together and, you know, three or four people throw, you, you know, you can easily throw a couple of bags of ice in a bathtub and do and, yep. and roll that through. Okay. It's yep. not that hard. Okay. One of the, the things that I'm seeing a lot of gyms do nowadays is buy, uh, a, a simple a simple bucket from Bunnings that you can fit three quarters of your body in mm -hmm. and away you go. Yep. So leaving it out and six or seven people go through, clean the bathtub out and away you go. It's, it's not that difficult. So if I'm running a, an ice bath concept, yep. do I have to worry about the uh, hot contrast to that at all? No, look, I mean, I think yep. the you know, if you're in a traditional gym scenario, mm -hmm. I think that the hot cold scenario would be the the first thing I would try. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay, because that's going to be the easiest way to do things and also the most cost effective. Yep. Okay. You can get it done as soon as your session's over and it's done. Yep. But if you want to then take it to the next level, that's when the, that starts to come in and you start to look at how and when we can utilise these things. The in Sydney, especially now, you've got things propping up like cryotherapy and, yep. and you know, um, the, the 98 boys are using a thing called Cultivate Recovery Centre. So at, at Cultivate, they've got a hyperbaric chamber. They've got Normatec boots for recovery. Now, they're also sponsored by Young Henry, so you make sure you can also have a uh, good old-fashioned recovery beer while you're in the middle of it. Well, there'd be a lot of footy players and friends of mine out there that want to know if beer is part of the recovery process, <laughs> so... Fill us in, why not? Well, uh, 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 it, I'm just bringing your haters on, mate, because everybody wants to have a beer after training. Yeah, but so the, the simple thing is that I actually, I'm a heavy believer in that beer has just about the right uh, carbohydrate to sugar content straight after a training session. Nice. So you're a traditional beer drinker Absolutely. Then. Yeah, don't give me any yep. of that low-carb stuff. No, no, no. no low-carb, but uh, I, will, I will tell a, a very simple story that uh, back in the day we used to, uh, we were told that, we weren't allowed our first beer until we had a protein shake. So, uh, did you know a lot of football players used yep. to come up to me? I remember once I was at the Roosters and uh, who came up to me? Fitzy, I think it was, came up to me and goes, Mate, can you make a beer flavoured protein? protein because powder. I want to get a beer into me as soon as I can. Yeah. He's also talked about Fat Club they had back then. Yep. Fat Club, which is nobody wanted. Fat nobody. Club. Yeah. Yep. But they want a beer. Yeah. So, yeah. So, mate, look, I've loved having you on board today. Do you want to, um, when are your courses coming up? Anything you want to throw out there? Yeah. So, we're, we're all of our courses uh, will be on my website, also on. That's the Alphabet website. That's yeah. hillstrengthandperformance.com.au. I hope you're not typing that on an iPhone because it'll take a week. <laughs> <laughs> then just go to Instagram and, uh, and punch it through there. There'll be a link there, of course, and also uh, they'll be on Wade Farmers and Chocolate Boxes websites as well. Nice. We're going to get those guys on soon, actually. Good to see you guys all making massive change in the industry. We're all about people that are really about taking it to the next level and not just trying to cash in on their latest ebook. Not that I'm against <laughs> ebooks, but I, I'm into people that give back to people. Yeah, absolutely. thanks for coming on board, mate. You're a thanks, mate. Today's podcast was brought to you by our partners in Fit, Happy, and Healthy ASN Nutrition Warehouse, DY Discount Vitamins, Fat Burners Only, Evelyn Fay, Mister Supplement, or find a retailer online at BodyScience.com.au/retailers.